delicate was born in, up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania in 1760. And of course, his father and his uncle came here in about 1772, picked out this spot because of the water power of the river, and decided to build the flour mills here, which they did, and a great many other buildings. They were very energetic people. George Ellicott moved here about 1775. I assume he came with his father on many trips because he was a teenager. But in any event, when uh, he was 17 years old, he was already an accomplished surveyor, and he laid out the road from here to Frederick at that age. And uh, in fact, the Ellicott paid for the road from here to Carroll's Manor, and I, some other people paid for it for, for the rest of the way, I suppose. But the Ellicotts were very ingenious, as we know. They had the most modern machinery in their mills, and uh, they had another innovation when they were building the highway. They had a mobile kitchen, which, uh, and also mobile houses for the men to sleep in, which they, of course, moved from horse with the horses from time to time. <laughs> The Ellicott's also built the road from here. When they came, there was no road to Baltimore. They built this road, and of course, getting up this hill that we call Nine Mile Hill in the old days was the biggest barrier. After they got up to Catonsville, it wasn't so bad going the rest of the way. But they had to have a road to get in to take the flyer to the wharf.
up a house that was 200 years old and been through innumerable floods and in pretty bad shape. But uh, this project uh, has been about 15 years in the making since renovating it. And uh, it's been about eight years since the legislature, John Coulihan and the delegates from the district uh, here in Baltimore County, that's where we are now standing, uh, got some money through the legislature that uh, was to be matched by private funds, and that really got the ball rolling. And it's been three years since we got this building moved. Now, many of you were here the day that it was moved, I'm sure, and the ones that you, of you who were not really missed something, because uh, it was quite an event. But uh, in any event, the more we learn about George Ellicott and his wife, Elizabeth, the more we realized that they were most remarkable people. And uh, I think if so many uh, uh, historic events occurred in this house, uh, that is reason enough to, uh, for us to <coughs> continue to strive to restore it to its former splendor. George Ellicott uh, met Elizabeth Brooke, who lived over in Montgomery County. They were, uh, her grandfather had been the settler, uh, main settler at Sandy Springs in 1726. And she was uh, his granddaughter. And uh, George Ellicott courted her. And one of the things that I learned was that he gave her a book on astronomy during the courtship. But she married him anyhow. <laughs> and uh, brought her here in 1790. He finished this house uh, just in time to bring her here. It was in 1789. So it was just 200 years ago that they moved in here. And uh, she lived here for 63 years. And of course, he didn't live that long. But she, uh, she died at 91 years of age. And she was a most remarkable woman and uh, well-educated. She uh, knew and had talked with the people that were the main people in our revolution, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, and Rush. And, uh, of course, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. She knew him very well. So she was a very remarkable woman. And when we look back, and think that a uh, woman of her ability and her intellect in those days couldn't even vote. So uh, we've come a long way. <laughs> At a very early age, uh, when uh, George Ellicott was still a teenager, he and Benjamin Banneker became friends. And uh, he recognized very quickly that Benjamin Banneker was a very exceptional individual. And uh, he loaned him books 
and they conversed. He visited Banneker at his home up on the hill up here. Banneker came to the Ellicott store on many occasions and uh, talked with the Ellicott brothers and with George Ellicott. And uh, George loaned him uh, some of his instruments he used in astronomy. And uh, but on many occasions, George Ellicott was away from here, and Benjamin Banneker had to go on his own. So he, he had the ability to read the books and uh, absorb the material in them. And he worked out an astronomy problem, and he made a mistake, and George Ellicott found it, and he was very chagrined that uh, he had made the mistake, and he went back and uh, found out where he had erred, and uh, of course, uh, this helped him in his understanding. George Ellicott uh, also encouraged Benjamin Banneker to do the almanac, which he did later in his life. And he also helped him to get it printed and, and get it sold. And this brought uh, some prosperity to Benjamin Banneker. And also know that uh, when Andrew Ellicott got the job of surveying the District of Columbia, it was the these people who recommended that Benjamin Banneker uh, assist him in that job, and he did. Benjamin Banneker was the detail man. He uh, kept all the calculations and all the figures, and uh, the, uh, Andrew Ellicott did most of the surveying, I think, but uh, he needed somebody to keep all the data together, and I think that's uh, the part that Benjamin Banneker played in that project and did it very well. Uh, it was right remarkable. Benjamin Banneker was, Banneker was 47 years old, and George Ellicott was only 18 at the time that they, they were met and were friends and uh, became uh, very close associates. So it's sort of an unusual relationship. There's a, another event that occurred in this house that uh, makes it historic beyond uh, most any other house that I've ever heard of. The uh, George Ellicott, uh, of course, the Quakers were uh, very interested in the Indians. They had a meeting in uh, Baltimore in 1795, and they took on a project of the Indians, uh, in, uh, especially up in the Northwest Territory, which was then Ohio. And uh, George Ellicott was chosen to go up with a delegation to meet with these people. They were having a council up there, all those Indian nations, the Wyandots and the Miamis and uh, Shawnees and uh, some others. And uh, so they went up and uh, they met with uh, little Chief Little Turtle and uh, the Raven, who was uh, the chief hunter of uh, one of the tribes. And uh, one of the things I learned is he went on hunting expeditions and took him all the way to the Rocky Mountains in those days, which was quite remarkable because that was about 2,000 mile trip all on foot, I guess. And uh, he killed a grizzly bear while he was up there. And he, when he came to this house for dinner, George Ellicott invited them when they came, uh, they came to Baltimore, the Indian chiefs, and they went to Washington to meet with the president and the secretary of war. And uh, then they came uh, here in Ellicott City and stayed in this hotel right across the railroad here closest to the track. That building was the hotel at that time. And uh, George Ellicott, of course, invited them to, uh, this was in 1811. And uh, they came, and uh, Chief, the Raven, Chief Raven, he, he was the great hunter. And he wore his grizzly bear robe that he had uh, killed in the Rocky Mountains. And it still had the claws on it in the teeth of the grizzly bear. <laughs> And he had on his paint, and he was pretty fierce looking, but they said he had a very good disposition. <laughs> and when he sat down to the table, and had a great array of things to eat, but the thing that the raven liked the most was a big pot of hominy, because that was the chief food of the Indians in Ohio, apparently. So he was quite pleased. And that was the first time his wife said anything the whole time over here, when they sat down and saw the big pot of hominy in front of him. But in any event, uh, George Ellicott made two trips up to Ohio on the, the Indian uh, business. Uh, one of them, uh, one was in 1799, and the second one was in 1804. 
And uh, at that time, he was gone three months and four days, and they traveled 2,000 miles on horseback. And uh, Chief Little Turtle was the uh, chief, the main chief, and uh, he had defeated the American forces uh, up in Ohio, and uh, it was one of the few battles that the Indians ever won against the uh, Americans. Of course, General Wayne beat them very decisively later and uh, forced them to take a treaty, which uh, pretty much took a lot of their land away from them. Uh, one of the problems that uh, worried Chief Little Turtle was the white people giving the Indians alcohol. And uh, so George Ellicott prepared a memorial to the Congress and went over there and presented it. And uh, the Congress uh, passed a law which forbid anybody selling alcohol to the Indians. And of course, that, uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't very effective, but at least uh, the government uh, recognized the problem, and there were some people who wanted to do something about it. And uh, the Secretary of War rode over here from Washington. His name was Dearborn, General Dearborn. He was one of the uh, Revolutionary War people, and he was Secretary of War in 1804. When we heard that these people, were, the Quakers, were going up to Ohio to see Chief Little Turtle, he got on his horse and rode to Ellicott City, came to this house, and delivered uh, a letter to the chief, the general at Fort Wayne in Indiana, to which said in effect to give these people a red carpet treatment when they got there and just do anything they wanted to do which, uh, of course, they did. They took the letter up, and uh, when they got there, they called in, sent the messengers out, and they brought all the Indian chiefs in, and they met them there. Uh, what do you think of this particular move? Uh, what was the most typical part of it? How does it rate moves that you have made over Lottest a lifetime of, of moving? Bitch I've ever had in my life. It took two to two and a half years off of my lifespan because of the age and the rotten mortar. And it was a doozy. It worried me more than any damn building I've ever had hold of. And that is a bona fide fact. And everybody that was here on Saturday will bear witness to that. Wait, you, most difficult house you've ever moved? Most difficult structure? Yeah, it worried me more than any because the back wall is more rubble stone than the front wall is. The front wall is in good condition, the back wall is in terrible condition with the small stone. We had trouble with the back wall from the very damn first day we started the jacking. And that is why, and when the worry started. Uh, when you say you had trouble, would you describe that a little bit? Well, you got a door post, you got a column, a small column right in the middle of a two doors back there. And when we tightened up, the stone wanted to bulge a little bit. Those kind of things make you wonder, is the damn thing gonna stay in one piece? And of course, you don't take them with the idea that they're not gonna stay in one piece. You got to be an optimistic pessimist, I suppose, or a pessimistic optimist. You know it can come down, but you figure it won't come down. It better not come down. It can't come down on top of your damn head. If you do, you're gone. So it was a doozy, but it turned out it moved fine. It moved far better than I really expected. Uh, what about your difficulty in getting it on Saturday morning up that uh, incline across uh, Frederick Road? Did that surprise you? Or well, not? the difficulty was because the uh, street was wet and the tracks couldn't get any traction. I was trying to do it as fast as I could for the benefit of the highway department to open it up. And we wanted to pull it rather than winch it with the cables, which we had done all the way up the grass plot. So we hooked all five of them up and tried to drive direct, and it didn't work because there was no traction on that road. So then we have to stop and go to the slow procedure of hooking up the cables and winch it just like we did over on the grass plot. So then it was no problem. But you had a lot of trucks in front of the uh, tractors. Now, is that That's somebody anchor. called it a dead man, or what do you dead call it? Dead man or an anchor. You got the anchor. No matter how strong a winch you got on your vehicle, you got to be able to keep the vehicle still. So you got to put something in front of them to hold them down in order to get up that grade. Now, once the front wheels got up the grade, you notice the pull wasn't as much. So I pulled that better after the front tire got Well, up once you got it on the street, did you feel that you had it made? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we felt better about it. The first 10 feet, we felt 100% better about it. The first 10 feet, I wouldn't let anybody even walk under it as we were pulling it. You test it out. You want to make sure everything is going. We watched our inside braces. We've got inside braces running between the front and back wall. Well, another thing that got
got me worried. Is one of those braces fell out one day. Two of them fell out. Two of the braces fell out. Now that tells you that those walls perhaps moved out maybe a 32nd of an inch or something to let that brace get loose enough. However, it's not necessarily so. Uh, could be we didn't have the brace wedged in tight enough to stop. Uh, during the revolution, uh, it was a very difficult time for the Quakers. Of course, when we broke away from England, the currency uh, was no longer uh, available to us, and it made commerce very difficult. And of course, being Quakers, uh, the uh, Ellicotts didn't take much of a part in the revolutionary fighting, although two of them did. And uh, for that, they were written out of the Quaker meeting. Uh, one of them got back later, the other one never did. And of course, you've all heard of Andrew Ellicott, I suppose. He was a first cousin of George Ellicott. And he, came, uh, uh, he was a major in the army. I don't know how he managed it. But uh, in any event, he was a great surveyor in this country in his day. He laid out the Erie Canal, he laid out Washington, D.C. Jefferson sent him to uh, Louisiana to straighten out the border between Louisiana Purchase and, and Spain, which was Florida at that time. He did all those things and many, many other things. And uh, so uh, this house has seen a great deal of history. And uh, I think uh, we finally have the money for the most important ingredient. And, uh, this time next year, I hope we'll all be here and it'll all be finished. Hopefully before uh, that. But, uh, Elizabeth. No, she didn't have that. <laughs> they had seven. Oh, I thought you told me they had twelve. It was Martha Ellicott who had twelve. Oh, Martha's one of the daughters. And, uh, of course, that was the daughter. She was the most remarkable woman also. Uh, in many, many ways. But, uh... She was the she was the daughter. She had uh, these people had seven, and they all uh, did very well, married well, and were successful people. Well, the house was subject to so many floods. They had a terrible flood in 1780, right in the middle of the revolution, that frankly wiped the elephants out here. Uh, they were like beavers. They came right back and <laughs> rebuilt everything. And uh, of course, today the government wouldn't allow you to build in the floodplain. So. <laughs> But uh, didn't have much government in those days. And uh, uh, oh, there's another story that is worth relating, if you don't mind me going on a little bit. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> in 1783, when we signed the treaty on, on the revolution, that was the end of the revolution, uh, the country had a big uplift, and the elegants were not to be left out of it. They went to Baltimore and bought 10 acres of land at the foot of St. Paul Street and brought it over to Light. And it was sort of a muddy flat at that time. It all settled in, I think. And, of course, they needed a wharf to ship the flour out that they made here and to haul over the road to Baltimore. And uh, so uh, they applied their mechanical genius to that project also. They made a dredge, which was first powered by men, but later powered by horses, and they drank, uh, dug out the whole uh, place in there and made themselves a nice wharf, and then they sold the city on the idea of financing them a little further, and uh, I guess the whole inner harbor in there was dug out by that. Made it nine feet deep, which was enough for those ships of those days to come in. And, uh, and they built warehouses there to store things in and all that sort of thing. They built a three-story brick warehouse. Now, I don't know whether that might be the one that's still there or not. I don't know. But uh, anyhow, they, that's something else they did. And uh, nobody been more important than uh, Charles Wigand, who uh, has been the front man and uh, has held us all together the whole way. And uh, we certainly owe a great deal to him. But uh, I think this is going to be a great addition to both this part of Baltimore County and also Ellicott City. And uh, it's going to be a showplace we'll all be proud of. Uh, I know it's taken a lot of money and a lot of time and all that thing, but it's going to well be worth it. And uh, something we'll always be proud of.
together, and some of these descendants of George Ellicott are going to be in there with those trials, putting some rocks and things together. This is the cell.
Bob, good morning. I'm Jeff Lees, architect, working with the Historic Ellicott City on this project. Good morning. This is Larry Harback, morning, site Jeff. superintendent for Azola Commercial Construction, is working on this project. And we thought we could discuss some of the aspects of the construction of this house with you for posterity and for a little bit of, uh, if every, anybody in the future ever wants to restore this house exactly, maybe they'll have some clues as to why we did the things we did. Bob, we want to talk a little bit about the windows here. This would have been a cellar window, but not a window, but it would have been a series of louvered bars with a sill here and one continuous header stud. Bob, the front of the house had one or two major changes to it in the colonial revival era felt that this was a more appropriate door for this house. These full stone lintels across the tops of the windows are only on this main section of the house. The mother-in-law addition was built with the head of the window having individual stones set in place. We're in the first floor main hall, the center hall of the house. It was always a nice space. There was this stairs that ran up. We're fortunate that it survived the floods. 